Well, uh, good morning. I'm Peter Riley from Deakin University in Melbourne, Australia. It's after midnight here, so uh, please forgive my live absence. But today I would like to share with you some results of applying deep neural networks to the detection and clinical staging of COVID-19 chest x-rays. The additional aim of this study was to undertake these evaluations with relatively modest computational resources, those which are typically available to the student cohort at Deakin, and that translates to something like 1 to 10 teraflops with floating point 32. Well, the Faculty of Health at Deakin has long mandated a medical informatics curriculum across its courses, but it's only recently extended those proficiencies to include artificial intelligence and machine learning. Uh, this follows on from the increasing number of AI applications which are successfully acquiring FDA approval. Uh, there are currently about 135 such algorithms just in radiology alone, and no doubt there will be an avalanche to come. You uh, may view this growing list from the American College of Radiology uh, in the link shown below. In medical imaging, we already incorporate extensive coverage of medical informatics, but not AI ML. So we now propose to implement such a research project option into the fourth year curriculum. An imaging application is the most appropriate, which needs to be tailored to the skills of the students and the computational resources available. Our previous R&D experience uh, with nuclear medicine cardiac images has shown that reasonable processing time would be most obtainable with computed tomography and magnetic resonance images. These are typically 256 or 512 squared, and these would be trained uh, on an adapted deep neural network such as ResNet by transfer training. In this project, we're looking at chest x-rays, but chest images are typically 2,000 by 2,500 pixels with a 14-bit depth. Processing such images would require an excess of petaflops capability, which we simply don't have. Fortunately, though, we do have in the literature successful differential diagnoses using scaled chest images, not the least of which was from a recent Wolfram summer camp. The other benefit of using COVID-19 images is not just that it's topical, but there are widely available image data sets, for example, from Kaggle, GitHub, and more from our local clinical stakeholders. Indeed, one of the main problems in undertaking our one semester research project is actually acquiring the images needed. Even retrospective studies may require ethics approval, so those formalities must already be in place. Well, the first project is to differentiate a COVID-19 pneumonia from other viral pneumonias and normals. A review of over 5,000 images showed a mixture of orientations. The posterior anterior view is the most uh, general view. view. Uh, the other AP lateral images and other modality images were not included in this final selection. Other potentially uh, biasing factors such as intubation and other interventional artifacts were also rejected. And so from the remainder, we randomly selected 1,200 images in each of the three categories, COVID, normal, and other viral images. From each of these, 100 images uh, were selected randomly as test images, and the remainder we used for training. We employed both ResNet50 and the Wolfram Image Identity uh, Identify Network models. They were adapted to our task by replacing the last two layers and specifying the output classes as shown below. We go on to restrict the training to just the, uh, the classifier layer. Um, we are also utilizing the GPU, in this case, with approximately 2,000 CUDA cores, uh, giving us up to about 4.6 teraflops for FP32. And here we see the success of the training, with ResNet giving about 100% uh, sensitivity for COVID-19, that is, there are no false negatives. Also achieving 99% specificity, 
so a very uh, low false positive rate. These are criteria pretty much uh, what is desired for uh, a screening test. And shown below, we see the ResNet confusion matrix, and I'm also showing the, uh, the Wolfram uh, ROC curve, showing similar types of results. So what do these outcomes tell us? Well, firstly, the processing required with even uh, this large data set was just a few minutes. This is an order of magnitude faster than our previous experience using Python platforms based on nano accelerators, which means it is now possible to demonstrate multiple training options within the space of a normal lecture period. The expected outcomes for the students following these hands-on uh, experiments is for an enhanced appreciation uh, for the possibilities of AI in medical diagnosis, and they'll also be aware of the potential pitfalls, for example, the presence of biasing artifacts in the training data sets. It's anticipated that AI will proliferate into their daily job setting, so this experience should make them both more tolerant and somewhat more confident in managing these new resources. Clinically, well, it's great to produce something of diagnostic value, but that's only the tip of the iceberg. There also needs to be a method of embedding these developed neural uh, net tools into the daily workflow, and that is not yet a common facility. In our case, we employ a Philips IntelliSpace workstation to deploy these. Of course, we can only undertake this work in a research capacity. Routine clinical deployment depends upon lengthy and extensive federal compliance testing. And this would most probably be undertaken in conjunction with a major radiology vendor such as Philips, GE, Siemens, and so on. Well, moving on to the clinical staging project, the main problem encountered is finding a large enough data set to train on. Of the 5,000 plus images available, only about 450 had detailed clinical staging information available. This number was further reduced due to the fact that most of the late stage images are anterior posterior oriented. This is because the patient will usually be in these late stages, is isolated in intensive care, and the x-rays are acquired with the imaging detector either behind or below the patient in the bed. So there are also uh, some PA images with interventional artifacts, which had to be rejected also. Well, with these restrictions, we found about 50 usable and well-documented images in each of the early and late categories. These categories are defined in the reference shown below. They correspond to images acquired in the early stage 2 period of 1 to 3 days from COVID onset and the well-separated late stage 3 period 7 to 10 days from onset. As before, we adapted the ResNet 50 neural net for these two classes. Well, the outcomes for this network resulted in an 80% accuracy. This is actually better than anticipated given the small training data set available. It is at least encouraging and we are continuing to work on this project, which is contingent upon acquiring uh, further good validated data. Well, just to finish up, I would like to address some issues arising, mainly to do with quality assurance. We've seen that it is quite important to validate the training data, otherwise you are just as likely to be differentiating PA from AP images instead of the intended detection of early from late staging. The presentation quality of the images in the public database uh, can be quite broad. There are various artifacts due to over and under exposure and various rotated torsos which can obscure anatomy. Now, this isn't such a problem uh, when training with large data sets. Indeed, you're using a true cross-section of the image quality that's out there in the clinics. But these successes depend upon having large numbers of samples. So this was fine for our COVID-19 detection uh, neural net. However, when it comes to our staging neural net, there simply were insufficient numbers for the neural net to be able to generalize. We made a first attempt with 300 samples, 
uh, which gave us an accuracy of 45%. But by filtering out the worst of those artifacts from the data set, the remaining 100 cases uh, now gives an improved accuracy of 80%. Well, these observations have led us to undertake further neural net applications. Since data validation is such a time-consuming process, then what better application for machine learning? So this now continues as a work in progress. Well, thank you for your attention. I hope you have found something of benefit in the presentation, and I trust you will enjoy the rest of the conference. Bye now.